This is the Pfeffer on Power, Accelerating Your Career podcast. I'm Jeffrey Pfeffer, your host. And every other week, we bring you some extraordinary, interesting person who I know who can speak to the topic of power and influence and how they have used it in their own life and in their own career. And today, I am privileged and thrilled to be joined by the amazing Tadia James. I met Tadia when she was a student in my class. I have brought her back many times, and I've actually had her record a video for my online version of the Power class because Tadia is not only exceptional, but she can speak to an issue that often comes up. Tadia has and still is involved in the finance industry. As we know, out of the trillions of dollars of assets that are managed globally, less than 2% are managed by women or people of color. Tadia is both a woman and an African-American and can speak to the issue of the relevance of this material for women and people of color. She is often the only woman in the room, the only black in the room, and often the youngest person in the room, and has built for herself an amazing career and has an amazing presence. Welcome to the Pfeffer on Power podcast, Tadia. It is such a pleasure to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So why don't we begin by giving us a brief version of your resume, what you did prior to business school, and what you're doing now and building your own firm, and for that matter, what you did uh, to build your presence and visibility while you were in business school. Sure. So so when I first started my career at J.P. Morgan on Wall Street, I was in the corporate and investment bank and then in cybersecurity threat intelligence, managing how threat intelligence data was allocated throughout the different lines of businesses. Then after that, I went to business school at Stanford, as you know. While I was there, I was working in venture capital at a new fund at the time called Gingerbread Capital that allocates uh, investment funds specifically to women in venture capital that are building funds. Soon after that, I started my own company called Align Generation, and we advise and develop startups across three different verticals, the first being sustainability, the second being equitable social systems, so think systems and structures that govern our society, and then the third is human consciousness, so any startups that are specifically devoting their energy and intention to expanding human consciousness, think mental health therapies, plant medicine, psychedelics, things of that nature. So that is what we do at Align Generation. So... One of the reasons why I wanted you on here is that you have come to my class and spoken in this video, as I mentioned, uh, many times about the issue of the relevance of this material for women and underrepresented minorities. And as I said, in in introducing you, you often found yourself the only woman in the room, the only African-American in the room, certainly the youngest person in the room. Talk about how you've used this material or your opinion of the relevance of this material for the non-white guys. (laughs) So, you know, when I first started my career on Wall Street, I, as you said, was often the youngest in the room, the only woman and the only person of color, always the only black person in the room. And so it was really incumbent on me early on to get clear about how I was going to gain visibility, be seen and heard for my ideas and really add value to the table. So there was really three things that I focused on. Uh, The first was around competency. So I would learn as much as I could about the topic beforehand and get really competent in what I was talking about because I knew that that would build my confidence in whatever the topic for the meeting was. The second was really about presentation. So I would wear things that made me feel powerful. I would sit up in a way that made me feel powerful. I would really focus on the exterior things that I could control that made me feel really powerful. And then the third, and what I would say was really the most important thing was a sense of self-esteem and self-worth. So in any room that I went into, and even now, it didn't matter to me how famous someone was or how much money they had or how big their stature was, 
I never put people above myself in terms of importance. And so if I am the youngest in the room or the only woman in the room or the only person of color in the room, assuming that the competency levels are the same across the board, that inherently means that I'm coming to the table with a level of fluency in language that other people don't have. And so I wore all of that as a strength and brought all of, bring all of that into a room whenever I am the only quote unquote in a room. Yeah, I like how you speak to that. And basically, what you're talking about is getting out of your own way, not coming in with a set of assumptions that says, I'm Tadia, I don't deserve to be here. Or I'm Tadia, and I'm in any way disadvantaged by who I am or my background. I love the way that you show up with competence and with confidence. And also, I love the way, because I've seen it when you come to my class, I mean, you dress well, you don't come in looking, you know, like some, you know, Silicon Valley person, and you often will wear heels, and you often show up <laughs> in a way, you know, as, as you said, you show up in a way that conveys power. Yeah. And, you know, there was actually a really good TED talk that Amy Cuddy gave before that was called Acting with Power. And she talked a lot about these concepts. And so even before I necessarily felt powerful, I would act it until I believed it myself. And so like with anything else, it's a matter of practice and discipline in terms of doing the things that are necessary to help you achieve your goal until you actually can feel it yourself. And so those different tools and techniques really were helpful to me, particularly early on in my career where I was trying to figure out my lane, what I wanted to do and things like that. So showing up in a way that made me feel powerful and never putting anyone else above me in terms of importance was really critical to establishing that early on. Uh, let's go back to your time at Stanford Business School, because you did some things, if my memory serves me, which I think it does, you did some things to get some visibility while you were still here. Yeah, so while I was at Stanford, I really was clear on using my time intentionally because, you know, number one, to go to business school is not cheap. So I knew it was quite an investment, not just in tuition and everything else, but also in the opportunity cost of not working for two years, right? So I really went into business school with the plan of, okay, when I graduate, how am I going to make sure that the ROI on this is worth it? There were a couple of things that I did while I was there that turned out to have a high ROI. One was I was on the founding team for Stanford's first Black business conference, and then I chaired it my second year. And that really was quite helpful in, particularly while I was in venture capital working with founders, because I was able to leverage both relationships to help the other. Another thing I did when I was at Stanford, I was in Views from the Top, and I was quite loud and vocal there about diversifying the slate and even really went out of my way to build relationships with leaders that I thought would add a lot of value to the conversations that were happening on campus. And uh, another thing that I did when I was at the GSB was a low keynote, which is essentially a Stanford's version of a TED Talk. And this is something actually, even what, three or four years out that is still referenced in meetings I go to because it, it's Googleable and you can find it. But I get a topic on uh, forgiving addiction and that topic and that having content and being published really helped to create visibility and create more opportunities while I was there and also post-graduation. So I always encourage students while they're there to really make use of the opportunities that are available on campus that can help them beyond just the two years that they're there. And I think that really speaks to another issue, which is to use, I mean, even if you're not at Stanford Business School or even if you're not at any business school, to use the platforms that you have and to use those platforms to invite people or to set up events or to get involved in committees or to get involved in, uh, in initiatives, to, to be as you were proactive. One of the other interesting stories that you often tell is how you came to start your own firm. Here you were working for Gingerbread Capital. Tell us why you started your own firm as opposed to just staying there. 
You know, when I was in venture capital, I I really enjoyed investing directly into companies, but I found myself having a lot of opinions about how the startups were running and different ideas that I thought could really make them better. So when I was there, I had the opportunity to also help support some of the startups that were in our portfolio and really got clear that I wanted to be more on the operational side and take some time to really build strong relationships with the startups operationally so that I could be an even better investor. So when I started Align Generation, it was with the intention to help accelerate the impact and visibilities of startups that I believed were going to change the world. So that is particularly why we focused on three different verticals, the first being sustainability, getting us in alignment with the resources that are here on our planet. The second are systems and structures that really govern our society. And the third is human consciousness, which we really translate as the work we need to do within ourselves in order to change uh, society in a way that is impactful and meaningful for everyone. Yeah. The, the reason why I asked you that question is once when you came to my class, you said people were asking you for advice and you were giving that advice for free. And you, <laughs> yes. and you decided to start a business basically right. based upon the advice you were giving away. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. So <laughs> it is really um, so funny you say that. It's really why well, I'm, I'm only repeating what you said. Yes, exactly. Um, it's really my joy to help founders and entrepreneurs and capital investors that want to create change across those three verticals. And so I had become known for and was always just giving advice and helping entrepreneurs and investors connect with founders of color, connect with women, connect in, you know, with different clients that they can have, customers, partnerships, all of it. And really was a sounding board for a lot of different founders. And at that point, it was something that was so natural and easy and fluid to me. I was like, hmm, I wonder if I should be creating a business around this. So that was really the impetus that started um, me thinking about developing an actual firm around these topics and building a team, building and managing a team around that. And the final thing I want to ask you about, for for which, by the way, you're very famous, is what you do, you know, so I mean, you've talked about being the only, and you alluded to Mm -hmm. um, the things that you do to kind of get over that and get over any sense of imposter syndrome. But you also tell a story about what you do when you go into a meeting that I think would be useful for our listeners to hear. So before... Every important meeting I have is something that I call, I call it gassing myself up, which is really just a reflection of reminding myself of my own worth, my own value, and not allowing fear to get in the way of anything that I do. And so before I have an important meeting or an important pitch, or I'm going on stage or fill in the blank, anything that is going to be highly visible and interacting with others that may cause me to have nerves. I go into a bathroom or I'll go into my car and I'll listen to things that really put me up and get me focused and excited about what is going to happen. So I was telling a friend that one of my favorite songs to listen to is Eminem, Lose Yourself. That is something that always puts me in the headspace of okay, today it's time to go execute, make it happen. But I will go into a bathroom. I will talk to myself. I know it sounds probably so crazy to (laughs) the people that are in the bathroom, but I just tune all of that out. And I will say to myself, like, you got this. You can do this, T. Be brave. Get the deal done. It's showtime. And that's how it goes. (laughs) I love it. This has been the Pfeffer on Power podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Tadia, it's been great having you here. Thank you for being part of it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. For further information, you can go to my personal website, jeffreypfeffer.com. The last name is spelled P-F-E-F-F-E-R.com. You can follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Our guest today on the Pfeffer on Power podcast has been the amazing Tadia James. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to share your wisdom and insight with us. 
Thanks so much for having me. Love being here. <laughs>